Hello and welcome to Truth Triumphant Radio. I'm your host, Cody Mori, and today I wanted to talk about something a little bit more personal. Uh, in light of all the stuff that's going on in the world, <clears throat> uh, the insanity of it, last time we had to talk about um, voting, uh, and I think some of that was um, maybe a little bit misunderstood, maybe a little misunderstood even on my end. Um, and I know there, there are Seventh-day Adventists that believe that um, you should only vote on issues. Sometimes you have to vote for people in order to vote on issues. Um, but I understand that argument where um, a couple of people have uh, corrected me, and, and rightfully so, uh, on, the, on the aspect of uh, voting for issues and not for individuals. And I think that's extremely important and in light of <clears throat> my recent sermon where we talked about when c-span covered the rnc there was uh they played ave maria and <laughs> had a, a a image of the virgin mary and it was showing all the the trump people that were sort of paying homage to that uh well not homage they reverentially standing there you know and and, and you know whether they're doing it the thing is, whether they're doing it to send a message to Rome that we are going to do what you say, very possible, or whether they are just trying to get the quote-unquote Catholic vote, all of that I think is irrelevant. What I think that is important here is that each and every one, each and every one of us realizes that Jesus is our Savior, and I, and I hold dear to that. Jesus is our Savior. I'll tell you personally, me, I'm not going to vote on this election because I just do not, I cannot in all good conscience vote for an individual who I think might help bring about the Sunday Law. And, and I can see all, all the stage set perfectly for either Biden or Trump to do that. I see I see it both ways. Uh, a national Sunday law coming. Uh, from either side. Um, and I'm not going to let one side. I'm not going to let the Jesuits who. I mean. I'm not going to let the Jesuits push me into a political party. And, and that's, that's one of the things that bothers me. That I'm seeing going on in christianity and especially seventh day adventism today is that people are sort of telling other people big no no by the way according to the spirit of prophecy telling people that they need to vote for the moral candidate here politics is supposed to have really nothing to do with our theology because i mean even today i was tuning into some of the news just to hear what's going on and I guess there is some issue with uh, Trump get, receiving some information on whether or not, back in February, where he did an interview with a man named Bob Woodward, where he said that uh, the COVID-19 thing could have been, um, was he, at that time in February, that he actually had known that it was going to be much worse than he was letting on at the time. So now they're calling him a liar, blah, 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 etc. Yeah, you know the drill. And I think I, I think it's really naive for any of us to think that anybody's being attacked here and not just that the Jesuits are playing both sides. Okay. But what struck me in all of that is that the CDC recently just released, I believe this was just a, not, not even a couple of weeks ago, that the amount of COVID deaths in the United States is about the of just COVID, and that's individuals that didn't have pre-existing conditions, two or three pre-existing conditions like a terminal illness or you know type two diabetes, something that puts them in the high risk category. Okay, so the number of deaths in the United States, which is roughly about one hundred eighty thousand uh, at this point, um, they say. From the CDC that about 6% of the deaths are from are for individuals who have no pre-existing conditions get coronavirus and then die from coronavirus 6% do the math on that it's about 9 to 10,000 people in the United States okay 
That's nothing. That's that's nothing. I mean, a loss of life is a loss of life, but we don't destroy everybody else's lives in the process. We don't destroy an economy in the process. And I was I was thinking about this, and I said, you know, they're talking about they're they're talking about this as if as if coronavirus was actually something um that wasn't way that wasn't blown way out of proportion and is still blown out of proportion i mean how many churches have closed how many churches have disregarded the mandate in hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 which says do not forsake the gathering of the saints and for what for for something that has taken out less people uh than any former real pandemic <laughs> in the past you know you you look at some of the other pandemics in the past i'm talking about the the older ones like smallpox you know you have even the tuberculosis when that was going around uh, throughout uh the 17 1800s and even in the in early 1900s where you had the swine flu i mean it doesn't it, it's it's it doesn't even compare and i'm just thinking to myself and i'm wondering if you're thinking this as well what reality are these people living in on both sides forget forget left right forget all that on both sides what reality are they living in that we're, that we're actually discussing um you know or we're actually discussing any topic really Based upon the assumption that coronavirus is is something that we need to take care of still, or or is it some threat, and that nothing has been blown out of proportion. The only people you hear this from is the people on the ground level, grassroots people like me, the actual doctors and physicians and nurses and stuff like that. They're the only ones talking about this type of stuff. But our leaders on both sides do not anywhere, really. I mean, there's a few concessions made here and there. But on the on the whole, they still act like coronavirus is is something we have to worry about. I mean, look, look how many trillions of dollars we went into debt, and for what? For nine to ten thousand people. And again, I'm not I'm not making light of or or diminishing the loss of any life, but we don't. I mean. New York is still locked down. It's been six months, folks. They're entering their third quarter of this. California is still locked down. People are losing their livelihoods. The middle class is being destroyed. And nobody is nobody's calling it for what it is. A destruction of the middle class. You know, a an actual desire to destroy the United States. All the protests, all these things, they're all working together for this. And we're being pushed. We're being pushed into there's this now this liberal movement called Walk Away, where they're all becoming conservatives. And we're gonna sit here and pretend like we're not being pushed to do something here, and that we're supposed to basically just ingest the assumption that coronavirus, which has been handled awfully by everybody, because because they base it off of the assumption that it's actually something um, that is some kind of threat to society. And people are very scared about it. And that's what scares me because I'm thinking to myself, am I, am I crazy? Am I losing my mind? Because I'm looking at all these things and I'm saying, what reality are all these people living in? I mean, you, you look at the numbers, you look at this logically and you're thinking, I mean, what, what do people what conclusion do people come to like oh well you know we just sort of overreacted a little bit here or a little bit there or maybe everybody had good intentions but really now as a christian i can't believe that as a christian i can't believe that because jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says that the heart is desperately wicked uh above all things and who can know it so and it's only the Lord. Only the Lord knows our hearts. But man, in his own, when left to himself, is an evil, vile creature. You're not going to tell me that all these people that do not have God in their lives, that they are, they, they have no negative intentions at all. Okay. 
Okay. You can believe that, but I'll believe the Bible. But anyway, that was kind of a long intro. I, I really just uh, um, I wanted to talk about today specifically why I am a Seventh Day Adventist, why I believe the Seventh Day Adventist doctrine. All right, and I think uh, really, really, uh, this this whole message, folks, the message, the three angels' messages. Um. The truth about the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, the seal of God, the Sabbath, just every single one of the pillars as you go down through it. These these messages, I wasn't born a Seventh-day Adventist. My parents are not Seventh-day Adventists uh, to this day. And I, I stumbled upon the message, actually from Walter Weiss, Total Onslaught, back in 2004. I heard it in 2014. So about 10 years later, I believe. And I, I just started to ingest it because I, my whole life was just a total sham. I mean, it was just, I had searched for happiness outside of God. And, and I had no idea. You know, I was groping in the dark like so many folks. And it's, they, they don't know, folks. They, if you're somebody who's been an Adventist your whole life, there's people out there and they are just searching for truth. They're searching for hope. They're trying to find fulfillment and happiness. Everyone really is at the end of the day. And you don't find it until you find this message. Because this message, this message, well, I can't speak for everybody. This message gave me hope. This message gave me purpose in my life. Speaking to you guys right now is, is a miracle. I mean, I, I'm... I've struggled with alcoholism. I mean, to the point, not where I was just drinking on the weekends. I mean, to the point where you're waking up in the morning, your hands are shaking, and you, you, you need a drink. And you don't feel like you're there anymore. You know, so when I, when I read things like in Revelation where it says that the, the people of the earth, the kings of the earth, and the merchants of the earth are drunk with the wine of of the wrath or the wine of wrath of her fornication or the wine of Babylon drunk spiritually drunk I understand what that means because if you drink all the time like I did you're not really there you're almost like a passenger in your own life everything's sort of foggy your memories don't really connect together and and that's what I'm thinking about with just just with this coronavirus stuff I'm thinking Clearly, clearly people are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And it's sad when you see Adventists and, and Christians caught up in this stuff because they're supposed to have the eye salve. They're supposed to be able to see clearly. And I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else. I'm not. I have a lot of problems, folks. I got a lot of problems I got to work out. I know that right now at this point in time, I'm not ready for Jesus to come. But I'm working hard to get there. Uh, and by God's grace, uh, I will get there. But when you see everybody and the way this has been, <laughs> by by and large, for most people, uh, other than a lot of these these grassroots move, grassroots movements by phys personal physicians making videos and stuff, which you we all remember were banned and everything uh, from YouTube, most of the world is is like it's like they don't reason from cause to effect. They don't. They're. They're not. They're not logically piecing all of this together. I mean, there are people out there that are awake. So I'm not talking about the exceptions here. I'm talking about the rule. I'm talking about the by and large. You know, for the most part, throughout. And I'm talking about not just here in the United States, but throughout the world. You know, you people are scared, and it's it's because people are spiritually drunk. So, when I found this message, this this message found when this message found me, I I had already uh, lost everything in my life at one point. Uh, well, everything in my mind, you know, of any value. I was I was in the Marine Corps, and I was I was a pretty good Marine. Um, I, I had good leadership skills. I was in a leadership position. I was on my um, on track to get promoted and all that stuff. And 
Then I, I was drinking all the time. I mean, all the time, and I couldn't stop. And uh, but w when I tell you about hopelessness, um, I can understand hopelessness. I understand the addicts. I understand um, the former alcoholics and, and alcoholics today with uh, the issue of, of drinking and addiction and what it does to you. Now, most men, the way they handle things is they get angry, and I'm definitely one of those individuals. And I can tell you, folks, I can remember, and I've said this before in my sermons, I can remember drinking, or thinking, of, sorry, thinking about drinking, like somewhere around like 11 a.m. or something while I was at work during a work day, and I would get so mad, and I mean almost like a boiling rage, you know, but it, all, all within. And it was because I knew that I was a slave. I knew that after I had that thought about drinking, you know, it was just like I'd, I'd be working on something, and I would think, you know, a vodka and orange juice sounds really good when I get home. And, you know, vodka because it doesn't smell as much. If you drink whiskey, people are going to smell it on you. You drink vodka, they're not going to smell it as much on you. And I remember, you know, this happened quite a few times. I knew, I knew that there was nothing that I could do in that day that was going to keep me from drinking. That was it. The fight was over. I had thought about drinking, and it was going to happen. And it was because I was a slave, and I knew it. And... I, I ended up going I ended up going uh, what everybody used to call a wall they call it UA now unauthorized absence and I had some suicidal ideations and I was gonna end my life back in 2011 and ended up getting pulled over by the police um, I was went to rehab and everything like that I, I, I Kind of got it under control for a little bit. Um, but of course, you know, I, I came back to it. And I was drinking again. And I had lost my license for a year. I had got demoted. I All this, all these things had happened. And I, I lost everyone's respect, you know. And I really wanted to kill myself then. Because it's like, you know, how do I... I all this stuff I built, it's just, I, I just destroyed it. But it took, it took a while. Um, but I did eventually... Uh, earn a little bit of some respect back, you know, after some time. And then I got out of the military and the drinking started to happen more and more and more and more. And I knew the route that I was going down. And I remember this so clearly. My mom kept trying to uh, get me to watch these total onslaught thing, which is kind of funny because she's not really interested in the message today. But at that point, she was, and she kept trying to get me to listen to this stuff from Walter Veith. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll listen to it. I was going through a tough time, and, and I decided to start listening to it. And I'll never forget that when the Lord came to me, I, uh, I got down on my knees uh, on my living room floor. It was an afternoon. And... I asked the Lord to kill me, actually. I asked him to kill me. Because I knew that I'd been drinking and I knew I couldn't stop. And I, I was loving the things that I was hearing. And, and I, I asked him to take my life because I, I just can't do this anymore. And I don't know why that was the specific way I prayed it, I guess. Maybe because I had suicidal ideations in the past. So, I, you know, that stuff kind of stays with you. Um, but my uncle told me later, my uncle Carl, he told me later that, you know, the Lord, the Lord did take your life that day. <laughs> because I'll tell you folks, after... And I mean, I was just bawling my eyes out, you know, and, and I, once I, I gave my, I gave my heart to God right then and there. I said, just to take whatever, whatever I am, you know, uh, whatever, whatever's left of me, it's yours. Just take it 
because I don't want I don't want to be in control anymore. And from that moment on, the urge, the obsession to drink and to smoke left me. Now, that stuff came back late. It came back later. The Lord had me deal with those temptations again later. But I, ha I got a reprieve from it. And my life had changed. And, and from there, I was looking for the truth. I said, okay, well, I want to do this on God's terms, so I want to find the truth. Well, the thing that I kept coming around to was the Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath uh, kept me from basically being confused into going into a lot of these other churches because the sabbath issue which uh walter weiss total onslaught brings out very well um it's part of god's law i mean it's really it's really that simple it's part of god's law it's the fourth commandment i mean enough said right we're done here let's wrap it up and go but people just can't accept that you know yeah you go back to genesis chapter uh Chapter 2 right there, it says, God rested on the seventh day, and he hallowed the Sabbath. And then in the fourth commandment, um, it says, For in six days the Lord uh, made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And then he rested, therefore, um, you know, so he, he rested on the Sabbath day. It's mentioned, creation is referenced again in the commandment itself. It says that, it was Jesus' habit to keep the Sabbath. It was the Apostle Paul's habit to keep the Sabbath. And what people want to always say is that, oh, that was the Jewish Sabbath. Okay. Well, then why, um, why was the Apostle Paul keeping it then? Why wasn't it being done away with at that time? There's nothing in the, in the Bible that suggests that it was done away with. This is one of the problems that you, you, you run into with people. Folks want to say that the Sabbath has been done away with, right? And, and they'll, they'll mention something like, well, it doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament that you have to keep the Sabbath. Now, actually, there's an argument to be made that there is. There, there most definitely is. But when they'll say the same thing, they'll, use the, they'll say this with tithes. They'll say this with all sorts of various subjects. Now, if the Old Testament is... Uh, you know, something that you're supposed to be reading, right? Then all the information is going to continue to build off of it, each other, right? So if something, if something is true over here, then it should be true later, right? I mean, they build off of each other. Essentially, what people run into, and I see this problem, and it's a, it's a faulty way of thinking, is they want to see in the New Testament where the scriptures will say, the Sabbath is still in effect and must be kept. Now, you're not necessarily going to find that sentence. You're not going to necessarily find a sentence that says, and the tithe was kept after the apostles by the Gentiles, and it's important for us to all keep it today. We want that, that verse, but the scriptures don't, have, don't need to give us that verse because they've already established that. Now, what we should be looking for, if we're going to look for any deviation at all, is we're going to look for something that says, and the Sabbath was done away with at this point. It was the Jewish Sabbath. That's a sentence that we should be looking for. Or tithe was no longer in effect. The Gentiles do not keep tithe. Some, a sentence like that. Now, if you don't find that sentence, that means that if you take the whole scripture together, the whole counsel of God together, then you're forced to, to come to the acknowledgement that they build off of each other. So it's taken for granted in the New Testament. If something has already been established, then it's established. That's why you see verses talking about how the sanctuary sacrifices, in, in, for instance, throughout the whole book of Hebrews, how the sacrifices themselves and the feast days in different areas, those have been done away with. You see, because if it doesn't say that, then you have to take it for granted that they're still in effect. But because it does say that the sacrifices have been fulfilled in Christ, doesn't mean you don't study that stuff. 
but the sacrifices have been fulfilled in Christ, so now um, that's what we focus on. We, we understand the object lesson and insert the key to the, to the object lesson, which is Jesus Christ, so that we can understand better how God deals with sin and atonement. That's what the sanctuary is meant to do. And the sanctuary, as it says in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, is a replica, a model of the one, of the actual sanctuary, which is in heaven, which we enter by faith. So it's still in effect. In a, in a way, it's actually, it's actually more in effect now than it was in the past. You see, in the past, they just had the object lesson. They didn't understand, full, well, they should have, because it was the object lesson was meant to help them understand the truth. But now we have the light of Jesus Christ. We can plug those things in when we look at them and have a better understanding. So in a way, the feast days are more important today to understand things that had actually happened prophetically, like Passover, like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, like uh, the Day of Atonement, which still hasn't taken place, a prophetic event. Okay? But all that aside... This comes down to sola scriptura. This comes down to what the Reformation started and what we should be trying to finish, which is the Reformation. It's about scripture versus tradition. Now, this was admitted by, I don't know if, if you folks know this, but Dr. Johann Eck was the biggest opponent of Martin Luther. In fact, they had a 18-day debate with each other can you imagine 18 day debate with each other over the issue of scripture versus tradition all right and this is what dr eck had this was in i believe this is in 1521 or 22 um but this is what dr eck had to say um now this was written in 1533 it's called the incurid incurideon of commonplaces against Luther, pages 78 and 79. It says this, There is no mention of the secession of Sabbath and the institution of the Sunday in the Gospels or in Paul's writings, or in all the Bible. This has taken place by the Apostolic Church instituting it without Scripture. Now he said that, he said that during... The debate now what why did he say that during the debate the debate because martin luther is his whole argument is that we should just follow the scriptures only and not the canons and not the traditions and not the councils and all these things uh from the church but that the scripture should be above all those things now johan eck he's making an amazing uh debate argument here against Luther because he's saying Luther he's like okay so you 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 think traditions worthless all right well why do you keep Sunday then that's what he's saying in a way some some folks have said that he he really won the debate just based off of this point right here because he said he told Martin Luther he said uh, you're a hypocrite you're gonna say tradition doesn't matter but you keep Sunday which is a which is a creation of the Roman Catholic Church you have no argument. And he's got a point, folks. He's got a point. So I think that's interesting. They claim it. They claim the power of being able to change God's law. That comes from the Roman Catholic Church. So the Sabbath issue was a huge issue for me. And it kept bringing me back to the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, which, <laughs> honestly, when I first heard it, and full and everything. Once we get the once they got to Ellen White, I basically turned tail and ran the other direction. But uh, eventually, you got to study that stuff out, folks. And if you, if you have any questions on it, I have a um, a few parts, ser like a three part sermon on uh, proving the prophet, and it talks about Ellen White versus some other prophets. Uh, you can find that on our YouTube channel. It's uh, if you go to our YouTube channel under the playlists. You can find Proving the Prophet there, and I just go over step-by-step step proof that uh, Ellen White was indeed a true prophet. And the difference between her and other prophets is, is that if you notice, if, if you talk to a real legitimate Seventh-day Adventist, they'll talk to you about the authority you know, of, of uh, Ellen White's writings uh, as a pen of inspiration 
and as a prophet that has uh, passed all the prophetic tests of a prophet. And it's logical to think that if we're living in the last days that God would send a prophet. Now, the difference between a legitimate Seventh-day Adventist that talks about Ellen White and let's say someone like a Mormon that talks about someone like John Smith, or Joseph Smith rather, <clears throat> is the Seventh-day Adventist is not going to glorify Ellen White. Now, people will say that they are many times that you'll hear that argument. You actually talk to them. You, if you watch something from, like, the Mormons, they, they'll, I remember we were, I was watching this thing on, on the Mormon religion. And they started out, and they're like, God, oh, Joseph Smith, you know, he was just such a great guy. And, and it was, like, on and on and on, and this person and that person talked. And then, and at the end of it, you're like, wait a second, aren't, what about Jesus? You know, they're talking about how great Joseph Smith is and how he was a, definitely a prophet and all that stuff. You don't hear that type of rhetoric from individuals who have proven Ellen White to be a true prophet. They acknowledge her, her prophetic title, but after that, no, in the beginning, that threw me off. I, I ran the other direction. I believed the rumors that she was possessed by the devil and things like that and, and ran the other direction, but God kept bringing me back. The Sabbath was one of the issues. Another one of the issues was the state of the dead. And I want to read to you a few quotes, actually sort of in rapid succession here because we're kind of, we're a little bit over time actually already, but we'll go for a couple more minutes. But Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses uh, 3 through 6. It says, This is an evil among all things that are done under, under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead not know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Never have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So this belief system that when people die, they immediately go to heaven is not true according to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 3 through 6. It says, for the living know that they shall die. So if I'm alive, I know I'm going to die one day. It says, but the dead know not anything. Now, if, if they are in heaven immediately or in hell immediately, they would know something, right? I mean, they would know, oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the bad place or I'm in the good place, right? But it doesn't say that. It says they know not anything. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Okay? So if you're in heaven... Wouldn't you look down upon your, the, your, your sons, daughters, your wives, parents, whatever the case is? And wouldn't you be hoping and loving them and, and wishing them well? Well, the Bible says their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. So it doesn't exist. Now, what does that mean? So what actually happens when you die? Well, when you die, Jesus, and you can look this up yourself, Jesus refers to death, and so does the Apostle Paul, as a sleep. You know, a sleep is a, you're not conscious of the things that are around you. You're dead. You just, cease, you just cease to exist until when? Judgment day. That makes sense, right? I mean, you're not going to go to hell before you're judged, right? You're not going to go to heaven before you're judged. Everybody's going to be judged on judgment day, that great day, the last day. And then... You'll either go to the lake of fire, where you will be, uh, you will go through your punishment and be destroyed, or you will uh, be raised unto everlasting life. Uh, in Acts chapter two, verse thirty-four, Peter says that David is not yet ascended into heaven in his sermon. So David, for all those years, he still hadn't ascended into heaven. About a thousand years since David was around, when Peter had that sermon. In John chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus makes it clear uh, of his desire to, uh, to 
bring all into salvation, and he says that he will raise them him up who trusts in him on the last day. He will raise him up. In other words, he will be asleep in the grave. In John chapter 11, you look at uh, how Jesus refers to death as asleep. Then he raises Lazarus from the dead in his discussion with Martha. Martha recognizes that Lazarus will be raised again at the resurrection. All right. And then, and this is this is one of the most easy uh, theological things to prove. When you go to Job chapter 17, verse 13 through 16. It says, if I wait, uh, the grave is mine house. So he's waiting in the grave for the Lord. Um, and you can continue to read uh, those verse, verse 16. It says, they shall go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together in, is in the dust. So they rest in the dust. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 18 through 19 states, for the, gra for the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee, as I do this day, the father and the children shall make known thy truth. Another one, Psalm chapter 115, verse 17, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. You can read that for yourselves, where it talks about those who are asleep in Christ will be raised by Christ when he comes with the voice of the archangel and all that. Um, it's, it's very, very clear. Old and New Testament, very clear passages that when you die, you rest until judgment day. It's that simple. Um, as we've, we've talked a little bit about the prophethood of Ellen White, there's actually, you can go to Revelation, where it talks about um, the spirit of prophecy being one of the gifts of the last day church. And the spirit of prophecy is a prophet, right? <laughs> so the gift of prophecy. Also, the sanctuary. This is what kept. This is what really interested me in the Seventh Day Adventist uh, denomination. Well, not the denomination doctrine. Not very well. Not very much preached in the mainstream church today, if if any at all. Um, but it's extremely important. So the sanctuary, how it's applied. So you can look at Hebrews chapter eight and nine for that as an object lesson. Then of course you go back to Leviticus and you can see all the things, and it's really quite beautiful. The amazing truths in there and you you can check out my uh i know bill's done stuff on the feast days i've done stuff on the sanctuary uh paul prano has done stuff on um the menorah and different things like that but then you have righteousness by faith as opposed to being saved in sin we are to be righteous by faith we we, we are to keep the law but not in our own strength uh, the law of God is, is applicant to all, and you have the three angels' message of Revelation chapter 14. Prophecy, this is a huge one. Prophecy, there's a step-by-step -step methodology, and it's easy to understand in history and in the Bible when you let it interpret itself, um, which gives proof of the identity of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the different symbols that are used in Daniel and Revelation, the seal of God. All those things were answered for me in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, well, doctrine. I keep saying denomination. In in the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, um, and nowhere else. And nowhere else were all these things answered in an easy-to-understand way. And then, of course, we have the health message. And I think that was that's just amazing to me. Who like I, I didn't care about health when I came into the faith, but look at how applicable it is today. I mean, with the different things that are going on, people are up in up in arms about all these different health concerns and everything's gonna kill them, right? Coronavirus, perfect example, which again is blown way out of proportion. But how much weaker would the coronavirus be? Um, if we all practice good health principles. So we have a last day health message where it talks about diet, fresh air, you know, not self-quarantine, but, for, you know, fresh air. That, so that's sort of important. And drinking enough water and doing all these things that can 
can help you trusting in God getting getting sunlight exercising you know all, all the things that we sort of already know um, but it seems like as our as our generation of the human race has degenerated over and over throughout the years and we've just become more corrupt and more evil we need these things sort of spelled out to us it's, it's nothing we don't know but it's stuff that we I guess we just need to hear sometimes and that that's amazing too that's found within the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine so um, those are a few of the reasons sorry I went on a little bit long I guess talking about my addiction problem with alcohol sort of uh, ran us an extra 10 minutes there um, uh, please forgive me for that I will try to keep it uh, a little faster next time so uh, but anyways I'll catch you guys next time you've been listening to Truth Triumphant Radio I've been your host Cody Mori and thank you so much for um, for listening God bless <laughs>